Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Interstate of Music podcast. As you know, I am Jeff Peterson, the host of this wonderful podcast. I mean, I guess you get to decide whether it's wonderful or not. And while you're doing that, um, you know, hit that like, hit that share. Give me those five star reviews if you would be so kind. But today, my guest is Matt Wilson. He is a professional musician. He is an author, 30 plus years of doing it. And, you know, let's bring Matt in here and find out a little bit of like, you know, what does it take to do something for 30 plus years? I'm trying to figure out, Matt, have I ever done anything for 30 plus years? So Matt Wilson, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you for having me, Jeff. It's an honor to be here. Well, geez, and I don't know if it's an, I mean, an honor, that's 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 making it a big bigger deal than maybe it is, but I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> We'll, we'll evaluate at the end. Ask me at the end if it was still an honor. We'll see where we are, right? <laughs> and I'll so see if far. I can even rem- I'll see if I can even remember to ask you that question. So far, and and as, as we progress, depending on how I handle myself through this podcast, I might forget on purpose. Okay. So, uh, All right. So Matt, tell me tell me a little bit. Um, when you're doing something for thirty plus years, you're clearly either stuck in it or massively passionate about it. Which would you call it? Well, I th- I think it's uh, uh, passionate about it, right? Uh, uh, yeah. I hate to draw automatically a sports analogy, but I think the only other thing I've done for thirty years has been a Dallas Cowboy fan, right? I mean, so you know, how about passion, those boys? Right? Keep, keeps you <laughs> locked in, right? That's that's right. So I uh, I fell in mu- I fell in love with music at a very early age. I remember uh, uh, going to bed at night with my little boom box. You know, we used to have boom boxes. You know, now we listen to it on our phone and the headphones. Back when I was a kid, the boom box would lay beside my ear and I would make cassette tapes of my favorite songs off the radio, right? So and, hold on, uh, real, real quick question, because I'm going back in time, because I'm 54, so boom boxes are, like as soon as yeah. you say boom box, it brings me right back to my Toshiba. And it's yeah. got, I, so I had my dual cassette, which I thought yeah. was pretty cool. So I do that whole dual cassette, making kind of my mixtapes. And, you know, for that, for that girl that, you know, meant a little something to me at the time, I'd right. kind of mix that up and, and give her a mixtape as a, uh, a, you know, for Valentine's Day. You know, it's the, well, those kind of warm and, and fuzzies. Back then you had to listen to the, the, the DJ on the radio because he would tell you what songs are coming up. And so if you, if you wanted that song to record yes. it off the radio, yes. you're like, Okay, he said it's coming up, and you got to listen to the radio for the next hour and a half, waiting for, right. I don't know, the no t- shit. Duran dude, Duran is, hungry like the wolf. Oh, that is awesome. I absolutely love that you're bringing that up, because anybody that is is going back in time and understanding what the hell you're talking about, which I do, you'd yeah. sit there with your finger on the record button yeah. to try to completely nail it, like, in the, like that first little beat, boom, and then you hit that record, and then you go back later, and you're like, oh, I missed it. I'm going to have to catch that another time but you know what i'm just now realizing i think that the djs back then knew that we were fumbling and bumbling to get the oh, yeah. start of the song and that's why they would talk over the beginning of the song right yeah because if they're talking over the beginning of the song then you don't care if you don't get the first few measures right. they're talking, right that's you just right, want right. to make sure you're in before he stops talking so oh man, this be, this became one of my most that. favorite podcasts just because of this topic. This is so right. awesome. All right, so I would go to bed with Jerry Lee Lewis throwing through my head and Billy Joel and Elton John, and and of course I was an '80s kid, and so all whatever the hits of the '80s. I mean, I was just so I fell I fell in love with music as an early, at an early age, and and uh, of course uh, uh, I, I was taking piano lessons at the time, but I wasn't serious about it. I just loved music. And so uh, passion, that's what it is, right? I mean, it's a cheap word these days. We throw it around all the time. But for right. me, it's, it's, it's really been, I'm, I'm, I'm in love with it. Sometimes I forget it, but uh, then I'll hear something. Uh, right before we came on, I was watching a video of Ray Charles at a jazz festival singing Still Crazy After All These Years. And, yeah. and uh, uh, I might have started crying if I didn't have to get on this podcast. Because well, I mean, you know, I'll, t- I'll take the emotional Matt Wilson. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, so so when it came to pia- when it came to piano lessons, you know, I, I used to I remember kids always saying, oh, my parents are making me, you know, learn piano. I've got to I've got to practice. I've got to do this. When it came to you learning an instrument, was it in the beginning, was it forced? And you, and, and that's why you didn't like, t- 
take it as seriously because it was a little bit like, you need to take piano lessons. You have to learn this. It's going to be good for you. You're going to thank me, you know, later on. And you're like, did it feel forced for you to learn the piano or was it like, I want to learn the piano though? It was absolutely forced in the beginning because sure. I'm a kid. I don't know what I want. Right. Yep. Uh, <laughs> right. I don't know if you have kids or not, but like, like right now, something that's going on is kids are on iPads so much that their eyes are going bad. Right. It's, a, it's yep. this whole thing. And so they would, they would watch the iPad till they started bleeding. If they, if they were given the opportunity. And yep. I bring that up to say that when I was uh, three, four, five, six years old, even a little older, I didn't want to play piano necessarily, uh, but my my parents said you're gonna you're gonna learn an instrument, and so right. I I would drive over. I wouldn't drive over. We'd drive over. My mom would drive me over to my aunt Mary's. That was my dad's sister, and she would teach us, me and my sister, piano lessons. Yep. You know, twice yep. a week, once a week, whatever it may be. And so in the beginning, it, it was forced. I don't remember hating it, but it was. Right. I mean, I look more. I look forward to going out when my sister was uh, getting her lessons and I'd kick the soccer ball up against the fence and, and kick it so hard that when it would ricochet, I'd be the goalie and I'd get to dive in the grass. So that's yeah. what I was. That's what I loved going over to Aunt Mary's house. Right. And then I have to go in and play piano. It wasn't until uh, uh, I started to see that my older cousin, Scott, uh, was getting attention from the the girls, yeah. By playing the piano and singing, that I, that's where I started to find some motivation to uh, to ramp up my piano game. That's awesome, right? Yep. Now, if you weren't going to at, back then, were you looking like if if I have to learn an instrument, boy, I wish it wasn't piano. I wish it was this, or I wish it was that, or was it like, ah, uh, I'm learning piano? Or was there other instruments that you kind of had this like, you know, side hustle passion in your head of wanting to learn? Well, when I was uh, when I was a you know, kid through my teenage years, I was I was a drummer. Oh, my, all right. My dad, um, I come from a, a family of ministers, and pastors of churches. And so my dad uh, was the pastor of our church. And he played organ, B3, okay. right? And he would lead the, the worship service with the organ, and then I was the drummer. And so I would sit, he was on stage, and then I was, I was off to his right. And man, he, he was playing that organ where he played bass with his feet, right? Okay. And then right. And so I just watched his feet, and I played drums. And so I was, a, I was a drummer for the church, and then the piano thing was, was the side, Right. Yep. Um, uh, but uh, then I, I kind of transitioned over to more piano, if you will, as I kept going. Fantastic. Nobody makes money playing drums, do they? Well, I'm I mean, and, and, and to be perfectly honest with you, what a pain in the ass to carry those drums in and out of every gig. Right. You know, well, you know what? If we're going that route, then I should have been a trumpet player. Right. Yeah. I mean, and it's kind of like being a catcher in baseball, you know, having to put all that gear on and take it off and haul it around with you versus just carrying a glove in and out, you know. So um, so as you were kind of progressing in 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 music, going through high school and kind of transitioning, when did it start to become what you wanted to be and do to make a living take on as a career when did that kind of transition in your head? Uh, I, okay. So uh, I remember in high school, um, I would go, you know, again, my dad was pastor of the church. So I would, I would go to the church on, on weekends and just play the piano and sing and pretend like I was Billy Joel. Right. Yeah. Just by myself. I'd go in there and think I'm writing song or I was writing songs and I was playing and singing and I was I was terrible. But that's what I was doing. I was investing my time in that. Uh, 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 I didn't know, as I mentioned in my book, I didn't know that that's where I was headed, but I felt drawn to do that. I wanted to do that. Um, Yet I didn't understand that there was a career to be had. I thought that it was just either you're you're playing and you know goofing off and as a hobby, right. or or you're Billy Joel. I really didn't understand that there was this whole world and career opportunity to be a working musician. 
Right. Um, and I didn't even really understand that even when I got my first job as a full-time musician, it, it didn't, it didn't quite. So it wasn't until, uh, I was already kind of making a living playing music that I say, wait a minute, I might be able to do this full time. Right. So you, but, you mentioned, you but mentioned, I, but, I, but, but I love, I love music. It started, you know, teenage years, high school years. I started to love music, started to want to, uh, do that more. I tried to make sure everybody knew that I, I was a musician and, and a songwriter and all that. And and my technique and my skill level was was low, but I had a knack for stage presence, and uh, uh, I just had a knack for feeling music and and uh, just this uh, sense about music. So, you know, I was able to kind of pass it off a little bit. Well, and, and, and music and music is so much, it, it, it's sure it can be technical, right? You know, there's the technical aspect of music, but then it, it seems like there's so much of who you were that was being the entertainer in the music industry and having people kind of feel who you are, see who you are, be who you are, and you're playing this music. Um, and, the, and sometimes that technical aspect can kind of go out the window a little bit when you're engaging enough for people to want to hang around and watch and listen to. Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, the technical side of music uh, can be completely separate yeah. from performance. Uh, uh, ultimately, from a performance standpoint, uh, I mean, I don't want to say anything's 100%, but oftentimes right. from a performance standpoint is – are people entertained? Are people yeah. buying it? Is the public responding? And that has that may have nothing to do with the technical side Absolutely. of music, right? So uh, uh, I, uh, you could put me on stage and I could entertain folks, uh, uh, but technically I was always chasing. I was, was always trying to catch up with my ability to entertain. In fact, I still am. You know, right. I, I don't think I'll, I'll ever uh, catch up the way that I want to from a technical standpoint, musically, uh, but I'm trying, you know, I'm always trying right. to get better. So you mentioned, you mentioned that it's in your book. So yeah. you're an, I also mentioned you're an author. So tell me about this book. Do you, is it one book? Have you written multiple books and what, what made you like take on that endeavor? Because that's no small task. And, and what, what were you trying to accomplish by, deciding you wanted to put something on paper, so to speak? Well, okay, this is a big answer. You ready? Here we go. Yeah. Um, I mean, what's the name so, of the book? What's the name of the book? And where is it available? Book, on Hooks. Okay. Lessons on Performance, Business, and Life from a Working Musician. And you can find it on uh, mattwilsonband.com. That's a good place. Or you can go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any of, the, any of the places, I think. Awesome. Anyway. Hooks, Lessons on Performance, Business, and Life by Matt Wilson. Uh, so uh, we, we, can, we can go back and grab whatever you want here, but I'm going to try to give a quick uh, you know, yeah, general overview. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, here I am, uh, you know, playing, just going to my dad's church and playing piano and goofing off and then doing what I can and pretending like I'm a musician. Uh, uh, but I got a job at uh, uh, Disney World right out of college playing at Jelly Rolls, a doodling piano bar. Okay. And uh, that's where I really started to ramp up my ability from a music standpoint, the technical aspect, because I'm playing with some really, really talented folks and I had to up my game. Uh, I do that for a few years, then I come back to Austin, Texas, and I'm playing there. Anyway, I had an opportunity. I'm really skimming over a bunch of stuff. No, here, totally. I, it's fine. I, Everybody's going to buy the book anyway. So that's solid. Yeah. You get to, you're going to get tons of, uh, tons of orders coming through. I hope so. It's about time. So um, <laughs> I uh, I auditioned for Moving Out, the Billy Joel, Twyla Tharp Broadway musical. And I landed the role and I did that for two years. And it was it was the most amazing time in my life. And it was also some of the most challenging times in my life. Uh, uh, I, I've kind of taken on this little uh, uh, phrase, Broadway, uh, barroom to Broadway. Uh, and that's because what I was for a while. I mean, uh, I did I, I forget playing. to say a, did I forget to say actor in this? I well, mean, I wasn't so an actor. I never acted. I never acted. It was all I did was sing Billy Joel songs. Moving out was uh, uh, so on the stage were the dancers. Ten feet above the stage was the bandstand, 
and it was 28 Billy Joel songs. There was no talking in the show at all. It was just playing the band playing and singing Billy Joel tunes while the dancers dance. I mean, it was Love it. Yep. fabulous show, hit show. Yeah. Oh, but I landed the I landed the, the lead in that uh, for the national tour. Uh, and uh, as I said, you know, I went from from barroom to Broadway, so I didn't have all the skills to be all the technical skills to be able to be consistent. I mean, that's the name of the game in professional uh, in professionalism is to be consistent. Anyone can kind of do it every now and then, but can you do it the same all the time, no matter right. what? And I really had trouble with that for a, uh, a lot of times. And, and it, it, it caused a lot of stress. It caused a lot of anxiety. It caused a lot of, I mean, I, there were times that I was really down about that because I, I really wanted everything to be just right for this chance in a lifetime, right? And so uh, uh, we're talking about why I wrote the book. So after, after a couple of years after leaving the show, I had this idea to, to write a seminar on uh, the things that I learned about performing under pressure. And so I, I, man, I got out the PowerPoint. I started doing all this stuff and, and writing, you know, this seminar. Well, okay, I'm also, I'm a working musician. I had to go do a gig and I was married right. and I was right. having kids. I mean, there are other things go on. And so I just kind of, I wrote all this stuff in a creative form, but just like kind of you write a song and you write half of it and go put it on a tape somewhere. That's what I did with the seminar. And so I kind of put it off to the side. Uh, a couple of years later, um, I found myself uh, leaving a partnership, leaving an, uh, a, a venue that I'd been working with full time uh, there in Austin, and, and I was in a transition period. And so uh, uh, while I was wondering what to do over a matter of about a week and a half, this flood of inspiration came over me and I just accepted it and I started writing uh, uh, what, what eventually came to be these hooks and the hooks are little statements, things that I've learned over the time. And so I, I, about a hundred of these things poured out of me in about a week and a half. And I just put them in my phone, boom, 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 right. still not knowing what I was going to do with them. And the idea at the first was like, oh, I got all these. Let's just make like a little coffee table book. So like, here's an example of, of a hook that kind of fits yep. what we're talking about. Hook 47. If you truly believe that a greater purpose lies in your endeavor, you will see that endeavor till the end. Right. So that's yeah. that's a statement. That's just a hook. A little hook. a little inspirational, motivational. Hey, if yeah. this hit, if this is hitting you, you know, grab it, take it, run with it, write it oh. on a post-it note, lock it into your head. And if that helps you get to the next from A to B or B to C or you know, S to T, all that kind of stuff, then boom, it, you did your Got job. It. Got it. And so I Love had it. I had like a hundred, I had a hundred of those, and I was gonna just just do those as they are, you know, one to a hundred. I didn't know what I was going to call it at the time. It just, I had the idea that's what it's going to be. And so I was working with a few people uh, to get some feedback and uh, man, I was so, I was so disappointed. <laughs> I say this because everybody really liked the hooks, but they also liked to hear what I was saying about them. And right. so I say I was disappointed. It's kind of tongue in cheek because at that point it's like, man, I got a lot more work. work. Yeah, that's more I got work. to write a book. Yeah. yeah, and so so then I went back and and I wrote. I took a lot of what I had in that seminar, right? Yeah, because a lot of that, a lot of the hooks are involved in that. And I just I started to write. I started to to explain why I wrote the hook, right? And uh, uh, man, you know, I would say the book was a four or five, six year prog uh, process. Um, I don't want to, uh, I, I finished the book during 2020. That's when it ramped up, but I don't want to say I did that because of the pandemic. I had already hired and commissioned and decided I was going to finish this book in 2019. It's around August of 19. I sure. really got serious. I said, I'm going to do this. But I, I, looking back now, I can say that having just the freedom of, nothing else to think about right right that's where absolutely we're yeah but i i didn't i didn't go hey man i got all this time and i'm not performing let's go write the book it was already it was already years years and inv years invested into it years so, invested in i yeah I, yeah so matt so. you know what the the type of book that you wrote being so personal being so much so authentically you because when i'm hearing 
you talk about it. And I'm, I'm getting to know you just through this podcast, your personality and your authenticity. How much did writing this book, going through this years of, of a process, putting these hooks down on paper in some format, how much did it actually make you better and more realistic or more passionate or more understanding of who you were and what you were actually doing by actually putting this down and writing this book? It continues to change me for the better every day. Right. Um, uh, if, if, you, if you start to get some momentum in, yep. in, in one direction, yep. right, uh, and it's, it's positive, you're getting positive feedback, then you want to build on that. Uh, uh, one of the hooks, and uh, in fact, let me just see if I can pull it up here quickly. If I can't, I'll just go from memory. Uh, uh, let me see here. Sorry. No worries. Um, one of the hooks, hooks 36, uh, forecast the need for change and reinvention, right? And yeah. so uh, you and I are, are near the same age. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the goals and things that I'd set in life and what I wanted to do at, at 25 and 30 and 35 and 40 and whatever are, are different now. Yeah, right. And, and so uh, uh, as, as I begin to pour out all these lessons in the book and different things, um, and, and gain some momentum and start to do some interviews and start to write some articles and start to talk and, and, and uh, uh, transition out of just being a musician into a writer, into maybe consulting, into managing, into these things, right? Then, then all of a sudden, when you're just a songwriter, you're walking around, you're looking for the moon and the stars and the, and right. the leaves on the tree and you're writing songs. But when you, when you start to think, okay, this thought, this lesson that I told somebody about, it created a little bit of a shortcut to make it easier on their path. And it was, it was a benefit to them. Right. Then you open yourself up to more of that. Right. Um, uh, it's, the, the it's, the whole re it's the whole reason I even do podcasts at all. It's, it's, okay. it's, it's a, a cheater way for me get, to get to know really cool people hear really cool journeys but by me being able to ask questions and, and Matt, I, this is, this is kind of what I love about this aspect on, on this side of the microphone. I did not research you at all before this podcast. I try not to know anything about any guest that's going to come on a podcast of mine because I want everything that I'm asking, talking about to be first run emotion, first run questions and have it be very real because I'm trying to also be everybody that might listen to this or watch this trying to be that for them, because I do think there's going to be a lot of people that listen to this and hear about what you're saying, be inspired and, and be informed and educated in different ways and take little snippets, little nuggets that, you know, that they, that they grab and go with. And I think that that's, that's really what you're even talking about this book, knowing that there is a level of education of life in the music world, um, the ups, the downs, the challenges, and, and, and kind of making them a realization for people when they think about it and they know that there's going to be, but to hear it from somebody that's gone through so many different aspects of it and turned left and should have turned right, or, or kind of went this direction and this, how this is how it worked out for me. It's so important for people to have those to go out and, and check out and read and, and listen to and, so that's why that's why I do it the way I do it. I think similar in the way that you're kind of putting it out there in your book. Right. If if I would have, uh, I mean, it's the old saying: if if I knew then what I know now, this this if I had this book to read back when I was on Broadway, it would have changed my life. I mean, I I, honestly, now I know that's that seems. Of course, you're you're. I'm saying my lessons and my life and all that, but a lot of the things that I talk about performance. Uh, dealing through uh, the ups and downs, dealing through anxiety, uh, the ability to focus, uh, putting things in perspective, how to assign meaning to what you're doing. All these things, uh, uh, pe I think people were trying to tell me along the way, but I just couldn't hear it. Uh, uh, even outside of Broadway, I mean, it, you know, it's been a long time since I did that, but but uh, uh, yeah, the, these are, I can say this, 
I want the book to be for more than just musicians. Yes. I want, I want the book to, to go beyond and anybody that's, that's, you know, any kind of business, any kind of walk of life. But I will say the book, if you're a musician and you're a working musician, you're going to read this thing and you're going to go, Oh, there's going to be so many connecting. Yeah. There's so many dots that are going to connect. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's not, not a stretch at all. So here's, here's something that you brought up in that, in that, you said the word anxiety. All right. Yeah. And, and I, I think because we're, we are that same age range here back when we were growing up, the word anxiety really wasn't thrown, thrown around that much. It was just like, um, it was, it was stress. It was like, you, you either had to deal with it or not deal with it. Anxiety has taken on a different reality of like, what it means, how people are coping, people that are helping with anxiety. So I, I, I think it's, it's interesting. I think I want to, it's something I want to touch on with you in coming from our generation where it was kind of just like a deal with it world. You know, it's like, oh, either you can deal with it or you can't and move on from, if a person can't handle this, then you move on to somebody that can, it, it wasn't as thoughtful as it is in in today's in today's world which i think is is a better scenario so tell me a little bit about how you've kind of come into a grip of what the anxiety aspect of this journey has been um through your challenges and and where did you get that strength to kind of overcome and adapt and kind of just find strength well yeah you know i didn't uh i first kind of learned about my struggle with anxiety from a personal standpoint, I, I, I was engaged at, at one point and it didn't work out. And uh, I had had, a, I'd had a lifelong counselor that I'd talk to every now and then, but it was, you know, it was just a resource for me. And then here I am a broken man from a personal standpoint uh, with a breakup from a, a woman I thought I was going to marry. And at that point it was, you know, I, I, we kind of opened up the hood of the car and said, Matt, you, you got a lot of anxiety yeah. every day that you need to deal with. I don't remember it to be such a big deal from a performance standpoint up to that time, but I really had to start dealing with it, like really, really dealing with it when it's, when it did creep on stage and it started to affect my ability to perform. Yep. Uh, uh, I guess from a personal standpoint, we can, we can hide it. Right. I mean, maybe, maybe not. It, you're talking about way so, back when it's so much of what we did. You suppressed it. Yeah. You didn't want to open it up. It showed weakness, you know, right. all these or things that we went through. Right. I didn't even know how to identify it necessarily. Right. It, just, right. Generally. I'm not talking about those that, that knew, but just generally right. the guy walking around, you know, he's not talking about it. He's just like, well, there's, you never heard just somebody I say, I have anxiety. You never heard somebody say it back then. It's right. but people will admit and be open about it more now than ever before, which I think, again, is a positive thing. It, it is a positive thing. And, and so I had to start really dealing with mine because uh, here I am again, faced with an opportunity of a lifetime and I was overwhelmed. Uh, and then I had to learn why. I think, I think uh, many years Later, you, you know, you mentioned how to find the strength. Uh, if for those for those listening that maybe uh, that this is resonating with, uh, uh, courage. It, I didn't I didn't make this up, but it's one of my hooks in my book. Courage is not. And in fact, I want to say it just right because uh, it's it's important. Uh, uh, and I'm sure you can kind of edit out these little pauses here. <laughs> that word. Um, yeah, I have my book on this. Uh, uh, on the iPad, I'll pull it up if it, if you can search fast enough. So, uh, uh, hook fifty three, courage is not the absence of fear; it's the willingness to face it. Yes. And uh, when I was uh, going, when I was in moving out because I was struggling so much, I would meet, I would get on the phone with my counselor a couple times a week, just to just to at, at times just to keep me focused and keep me going. And, and I, I was so disappointed that I was dealing with so much fear. And my counselor said, you know, uh, one day he said, Matt, you were one of the bravest people I know. And I was like, I don't understand because I'm dealing with so much fear. And he said, every night you get on stage and you do your job in the face of legitimate and irrational fears. 
And at times your discomfort level can be unbearable, but you push through. That's not being afraid. That's being courageous. Okay. Love, that so that's, is, a, that's inspiring right there. That's a, that's a really good place to start for anybody yes. that wakes up and whatever they're fearful. Don't, don't walk around. I mean, if you're trying, if you're still showing up and whatever it is, if you're showing up, yep. you may be, you may feel afraid, but that doesn't mean that you're fearful. That means you're feeling afraid. The fact that you're showing up means you're courageous. So that's a good place to start because that says you 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 have a place to fight, right? You you have a, a pl- you want to fight. You want to get past this, and and there's a lot of places in the book that I talk about ways to manage not only uh, personal anxiety, but I really talk about that anxiety that we feel when we're performing, when we're asked to do what we do in the moments of pressure, and how to deal with that, and how to process that and how to prepare for it, how to set routines before and after, how to set routines in the middle of it. And this is not just about those people playing an instrument and singing. This is for the people that are in the sales calls. This is for the people giving the presentations. Yes. This, is for the, this is for the guy that wants to hit the ball better at his weekend golf club. You know, yep. I mean, it's, it's for it, – Shakespeare said, you know, life's a stage and we're merely players. Well, if that's true, then – we have to know how to play. We have to know right. how to act. We don't have need to know how to perform. And some of it, you talk about the anxiety. Not only are we as a society are we t- talking about it more, which is a very positive thing, but I think one of the one of the ramifications of that is that we also can be quick to say, "Oh, I'm anxious. Oh, I'm anxious." Right? And that may not be the case. Right. It may just be that you're excited about something. I mean, I could really, we could just don't, don't let, don't let the word, don't let the word anxiety get in the way of you taking the next step, because I want to make sure, and this is my own personal opinion, the word anxiety has a negative connotation to it and it doesn't need to, it just is a realization in the moment of what you're uh, in unsureness or a uh, uh, an excitement or something that makes you pause before the next step. It, it, that's, that can be what anxiety is. And it doesn't, it shouldn't be a roadblock or a stopping point to push you backwards. It, it, it can just be a realization of the moment and the emotions and the feeling in that time for you to realize so that you know how to take the next steps. And, and I want, you know, it's, it's, it's not like it's some kind of profound, you know, thought I have, but often, you know, people think if they have anxiety, it, it's like the stopping point. It's, it, 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 it's a roadblock. It gets in their way. Um, and it just doesn't have to be that. Um, and, and I think you kind of mentioned, you know, a great way to look at it. Uh, you're spot on and, and uh, you're, you're drawing me to hook 18 in the book. Uh, most successful performances include a triumphant recovery, right? right? And I, right. I want you to go get the book because uh, the the, uh, the analogy I use is, is Rocky. You know, Rocky. Yeah, oh, Rocky, yeah. Box of Rocky, right? But I'll you got you that Rocky that. fedora going on right now. All right, come on. Hey, what are you doing over there, right? Hey. But the uh, uh, but I want to. I'll just go ahead and, and share something here. The uh, uh, it's something I came up with called the wash technique, and this is for those that are performing, right? Yep. And so, uh, uh, so wash technique W welcome the adversity in whatever form it manifests fear and doubt are the big ones. Usually don't be surprised. Don't fight it. Expect it. You're a human. These things happen. So you're playing and all of it, are you playing a song? Maybe you're giving a speech and all of a sudden yeah. the doubt and fear come in. Yep. If you are surprised by that, then you're doubling up on your problem, right? Yep. Welcome it. It's it's there. Okay, that's W. A, accept the discomfort. Getting upset that your palms are sweaty, your thoughts are racing, and your breath is short, that makes it worse. Accept it. It's it's part of it. Look, yeah. if I come along and, and punch in the arm, right, you, you're going to know it's going to hurt for a minute, or even better yet, if you're walking around the house barefooted and you stub your toe, you got to be prepared to feel that pain but you also know that it will subside in a few minutes, right? It's got to go away. So you don't get, you don't go, Oh my God, my toe hurts. I don't know why. So you accept the discomfort. These are big ones. Welcome the adversity, accept the discomfort. Now the the next one S stay on task. 
Yeah. Continue to do what you train to do. So I'm playing and singing. And all of a sudden I have this doubt and I start thinking about, oh, that guy's in the audience and that girl's in the audience. And these people are watching. I hit her. I hit a wrong chord in the song, whatever whatever it may be, whatever it may be. Now, now doubt and fear have come in. I rather than battle it, I welcome the adversity, accept this comfort. And then what I do is I start to focus inward on my technique, continue to do what I train to do. Don't bail out. Remember, Sometimes you can picture something that gives you joy, that diverts your attention just enough so you can get out of your own way and then focus on basic stuff like breathing. And then the H, harness the confidence and pride that follows overcoming the adversity. Because I promise you, if you don't get knocked out of your out of your out of your flow, if you welcome the adversity, accept the discomfort, you stay on task. You just focus inward, not outward, focus inward. You're going to pass. It's going to pass. You're going to triumph over that adversity because every performance has adversity and it has a triumph. You're going to get over it. And then you can have some confidence saying, look, I just got through that rough moment. We got a whole long show here. We got a whole long game. We got a whole long presentation we're going to stay with. And then you channel that resilience into into poise. And poise is defined as a stably balanced state, which means you were wobbly. And now you got poise and you're stable and you move forward. And I promise you this, maybe all that stuff you were worried about messing up with, nobody saw it anyway. Nobody, nobody probably noticed it. And even if they did, whatever, you're human, move on, go. Matt, Try. how much, how much inspiration have you, did you personally get being in uh, in, in the world of pastors and preachers, because the way that you come outward is such a teaching side of you, which is so much where, you know, so many people get that strength in church and, and from a pastor or preacher or, or in that format. It's so, it's so meaningful and so impactful the way that you've created your hooks and that those, those motivational, inspirational type statements, those bullet points style statements how much inspiration did you get in your growing up years from being in that world i I don't i I mean it's it's all the inspiration right i mean right uh there are uh on my dad's side of the family there are five wilson men and and maybe uh uh three or four four of them went into the ministry right and i'm talking about just my generation there's more now but but, uh, uh, you know, again, my dad was a preacher. My uncle was a preacher. My cousins are preachers, everybody. So I grew up in the church uh, and uh, uh, the delivery and the way that you see things. Um, it, it is an inspiration to me and it is an influence that right. I, I welcome right. and I'm, I'm grateful for. Absolutely. And Matt, er, you know, when we first started this, you, you, you said you were honored to uh, to be on this podcast. I want I want to flip it. I, I've been honored to have you as a guest on. on this podcast because this has been exactly what I think you wrote that book about. And that was to reach outward and share your inward outward. And that's been motivational and inspirational for me personally. And I'm connecting and resonating with so much about what you're saying. And I, I know so many others are going to. So thank you so much for being part of this podcast, coming on and being so willing to share it. And uh, I want people to know Matt Wilson is out there because uh, you're going to matter to a lot of people that you don't even know. And uh, so thanks so much for being part of this podcast. Jeff, thank you so much. And I've really enjoyed our time. And I hope that we can do it again. Absolutely, 100%. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Matt Wilson. I'm Jeff Peterson. This was the Interstate of Music podcast. And uh, this, was a, this, one, this one makes me uh, walk away with some goosebumps. Matt Wilson was our guest. Thank you all for joining. Thank you.